Good evening. Welcome to the policy subcommittee meeting of the Brockton School Committee for December 15th, 2020. Uh, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency on March 12, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20. Pursuant to that order, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the open meeting laws requirement that meetings be held in public places, open and physically accessible to the public, so long as measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. This meeting will be held and will be accessible to the public via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube and Comcast Channel 12. The public can access this meeting via the following link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton channels. I feel like a radio announcer when I go through that. <laughs> um, okay, so our agenda for this evening's policy subcommittee is uh, we're going to review current COVID-19 metrics. Um, we'll discuss the reopening plan and then uh, any other business that needs to come before uh, policy. Uh, Mayor, did you want to give us a COVID update? Yes, I sure will. And uh, I just wanted to ask humbly, uh, when we go to full school committee this evening, I'm going to ask that we take Dr. Rick Herman out of order. He has a family uh, conflict tonight. Um, so right at seven o'clock when we open, I'm going to ask if we could take a motion to take Dr. Herman out of order. So, um, so let me just give you a quick update again, uh, relative to where we are, uh, we're at 327 loss of life, 327 residents here in the city of Brockton have perished because of COVID-19. We are at 7,549 total cases since the Commonwealth started to calculate and currently we have 1,524 Brockton residents with positive active COVID cases here in the city of Brockton. If we look at reported cases in a 24 hour window, we picked up 88 cases today. So we are in a deep red classification. I do wanna let you know, and I know all of you uh, on a local level and state level were notified. Uh, I filed an executive order yesterday. Many mayors in the Commonwealth shared in this executive order as well. Uh, and we are rolling back to uh, phase two, step two, as of tomorrow morning. So again, um, wanted to let, just let you know that we are really seeing a surge. Uh, I was on a call with the Brockton Hospital Signature CEO, with Good Samaritan, uh, with Sue Joss and Dr. Maria Celli, Neighborhood Health Center, and the VA Hospital. Uh, except for the VA Hospital, the other two local hospitals are uh, almost at full capacity. We have some very, very sick people in the ICU. Um, and they haven't seen the surge since uh, springtime. So uh, that's unfortunately the latest and greatest in terms of metrics right now. Um, but I do want to uh, share some positive news that um, this morning we received 250,000 pieces of PPE from um, Mask and Medical, which is based in Woburn, Mass. Uh, they've been donating to other uh, gateway communities, uh, Fitchburg, uh, Lemonster, Chelsea, uh, and they came to the City of Champions today. So that's a game changer. We have those uh, with BEMA. Um, and again, we're just asking humbly for people to continue to be diligent, wear your masks. And when you get together for the holidays, please, please, please just be with your immediate family. I know some people think, well, the vaccine is here and we're going to be safe. Uh, but unfortunately, the vaccine is not going to be administered for some time now. So we need to continue to control our own destiny and, and keep with what the medical doctors are telling us what to do. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Great, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, any questions or other comments on, on that uh, item, Superintendent, or um, did any other member of the committee? Okay. Um, all right, so if we don't have any other comment or question on the-, on the Mr. Next... Chairman, I think Mr. Sullivan had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, that's the second time tonight. I'm sorry. Tim, the floor is yours. Mr. Mayor, just one question on the phase two, step two. What is, is that the restaurants closing or what is phase two? Step no, two? thank you. Great, great question. So let me just kind of peel back for a second. So um, the governor did a rollback last week, which actually had no bearing whatsoever in the city of Brockton because we were already there 
by virtue of being a red classification. Anybody that was a red classification, any municipality was already where the governor rolled back. Uh, last Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Sunday night, I was on a call with uh, Mayor Walsh and uh, 12 to 15 other mayors. Um, and, you know, we are working in collaboration right now. It has no impact on indoor dining, Tim, uh, whatsoever. Uh, it does impact uh, gyms, uh, fitness centers, uh, museums. Um, there is no movie theater in the city of Brockton at this time. Uh, you will not be able to be served uh, in a restaurant at the bar by the bartender. Uh, you can seat at the bar uh, for meal purposes, but the waiter and waitresses have to serve. Um, you know, I know I've gotten an influx of people really upset about the fitness centers. I'm not saying that the virus is spread in gymnasiums or fitness centers. What I'm trying to say is we're in a surge right now. And so for the next three weeks, my executive order is in effect for three weeks. We need to try to stay home. We should not congregate. Um, and, you know, we are hopeful that the mechanisms in place will help limit the spread. Uh, the good news is Brockton Hospital got some vaccines yesterday, which is great. Um, the city of Brockton has not. So it does not impact indoor dining, Tim, um, but it does, like I said, it, and I just illustrated in the executive order that I forwarded to you what it does impact. Thank you. And I apologize, Tim. Um, okay, anyone else uh, wanna weigh in on this, on this item? Okay. All right, so let's move to our next agenda item, the reopening plan. And uh, Superintendent Thomas, did you wanna go over that? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Yagostino. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the update. As you know, um, we are obligated to continue to look um, um, for a return date for our students. Um, first, uh, students, high need students, um, students with disabilities, so we can um, obviously bring them back to school safety, but uh, safely, but it's obviously it's imperative for them to come in and have some in-person learning. Um, so obviously we're gonna discuss with um, and listen um, to Dr. Herman tonight, but I think it's important for us to look at a target date um, so we continue to plan um, and negotiate with our unions um, to return in a hybrid model. Obviously we'll continue as the committee has done ever since March 12th is look at the metrics and take the health and safety of our students and staff uh, as the top priority. But um, we are obligated as a school system to follow, follow the Department of Education guidelines and, and bring our students back as, as, um, as much as we can in a in-person hybrid model. Um, and obviously that's what's best for our students. Um, again, doing it safely, but um, we do have to proceed and uh, putting a plan in place, having a target date um, so we can continue to prep and move forward with the teams of people across the district who are working on this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, does any member of the committee want to comment? And then, you know, uh, I, I did kind of have some dates I had, was going to throw out there to for discussion purposes and see what we end up coming up with, but before I do that, does anybody want to comment? Nope, okay. Um, so, you know, we had had uh, Lori Mason here um, and we had a discussion with her as well as with Paige Tobin on our special education students, um, you know, and, and starting to look at bringing those students back. There's about, uh, I believe it was about 308 if I remember correctly. Um, you know, we talked about that being the first wave of students coming back. And I, I think before we get into this, I wanna make clear that like the superintendent said, these are target dates. As these dates approach, if the committee and the superintendent and the mayor don't you know, feel that we need to push these dates out further, we'll do that. Um, so I don't want people to you know, think that you know, that's it this is how it's gonna happen and we're not gonna look at it again. We're gonna to continue to have our biweekly policy meetings and listen, you know, check in with the doctor. And, um, you know, we may, these dates are certainly subject to change if, if, it need, if they need to change. Um, so that having been said, um, I don't know, what, what does everybody feel about for special education? Uh, the middle of uh, January was kind of something we had put out, we had had discussed a little bit when um, uh, 
Uh, Lori Mason was with us maybe the Tuesday after the Martin Luther uh, King holiday. So yeah, just to remind the committee, that's um, the approximately about 387 students um, that are uh, obviously across uh, th uh, um, uh, 22 different schools um, in a hybrid model um, based on their IEPs. Um, and obviously then from that point, if it's safe to bring those students back, we would then phase in um, other students across the district, um, high needs, other high needs students, uh, uh, lowest, uh, um, uh, lower grades, lowest grades, the pre-K to two is another um, priority for in-person learning. Um, they would be phased in after. And then obviously we have to have different plans for schools that are larger. Um, some schools, it's just not simple just to break the school in half um, because the numbers are large. Um, you have 1,100 students at the Davis. You have almost 1,000 at the Baker, the George. Um, and then obviously you have 4,200 students at the high school. So um, we would work, um, again, with the BEA, with our unions, and uh, do a safe return uh, and a phased-in return once we get our students with disabilities back. Right. We're yeah, constantly, yeah. again, like you said, Mr. DiAugustino, const constantly reviewing the metrics, consulting with the mayor and uh, Dr. Herman. Yeah, I mean, and, and what's good about this phased-in slow approach is if we start this and things start to go in the wrong direction, we can stop and pull back easier and more quickly because we're taking this so slow, which I, I think is a good thing. Um, and, and we also are obligated to do that. You make a good point. We're obligated to do that under the Department of Education. Um, you have to be able to go from one model to hybrid to re full remote. You, be, you should be able to transition back and forth to that quickly with you know, really no hesitation. It's not something you want to continue to do, but several schools across the state who have had outbreaks in schools and um, there's been high schools, several high schools that have gone from hybrid to fully remote. Uh, Boston, I think Cynthia can uh, fill us in um, early. They had uh, students with disabilities in, um, not for a long period of time back in September and then had to switch to remote learning pretty quickly. Um, and now they're phasing those students back in again. So it's just, you have to be able to go back and forth and you don't want to do that a lot because it's disruptive to families and students' lives um, and also to the, uh, to the staff. But, you know, that's something you have to be ready to do. Right. Right. And as we're going through this process too, hopefully things are going well with the vaccines, more and more people are getting vaccinated and that's helping us along, um, you know, in the, in this process. Um, and, and again, I think it's important for us to continue our biweekly policy meetings and for the public to know that we're gonna to continue to do that so that we can make adjustments to the schedule, you know, that, that we put forth as, as, or as we need and as, as it's deemed appropriate. Um, so it was 387, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know where I got 308 from. Um, superintendent, we would, these would be spread through to all 22 schools. Correct. Right, so the social distancing uh, and all of that won't be an issue no, and, and, and um, I know that the Department of Ed, and I'm glad you brought up social distancing, um, has encouraged schools to go um, to three feet of social distancing. Um, I do not recommend that, um, even when we're allowed to bring students back um, in a hybrid model. Um, I would definitely stick, stick to the six feet of social distancing. Um, schools have set up for that. They've planned for that, and I believe... Uh, again, until there's a widespread vaccine, and so we know a lot more about this as we move forward, I, I don't see uh, um, why we would come away from a six, a six feet of social distancing. Yeah, no, I think, you know, they, they, they can recommend three feet all they want. Six feet has been kind of the standard throughout this whole thing. I don't know why we would change that um, and go with anything different when that's been the, the long-term recommendation since the beginning. Um, I don't know. I mean, if we, again, if the committee wanted to do a, a, a special ed, you know, hybrid return on the, again, tentatively for the 19th, and then maybe two weeks after that, try our pre-K to two. And then from there, you know, a grade level at a time, 
um, assuming this goes well. Um, I don't know what the committee's thoughts are on that. When you say pre-K, two weeks later, pre-K, are you talking about the high, all pre-K, or are you talking about the high, um, the students with high needs in pre-K? It would be all, all pre-K through second grade, obviously in a phased-in model. Yeah, if, if pre-K students were under special ed, special education, they would have been in that first. Okay, in that first wave, yep. Yeah. Right, Mike? Yeah. That, yes, some, yes. Yeah. Some of them, yes. Yeah. Not all students with um, IEPs would be in the first um, group with students with disabilities, um, but they would be in, obviously would start as the grade levels go, they would uh, be with their grade levels. You know, that's a great point. It's not everybody with an IEP. So these 387 students, uh, are these just the, I, I believe it's the SEI? They're our highest need students. Yep. They're um, sub separate students. They're um, um, emotionally impaired students. Um, there are life skills students. Um, there are students, our highest need students. And again, then you would, that's not all students with IEPs and you know, those students would be uh, phased back in um, with all students and um, I just guess a way to bring everybody back safely in a very phased in methodical approach to make sure uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this. There's a lot of work that teachers have to do. Um, and there's just a lot of social emotional support that we have to provide to our students because they're returning to buildings for the first time since March 12th. So, and a lot of them are, are going into schools they've never been in before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the transition, um, students going to middle school, new kindergarten students coming into elementary schools and obviously high school students going into the different high schools we have. So, you know, we, we need to spend some time getting students reacquainted with school, the environment, with our teachers, make sure you know, obviously we have to have a culture that's, um, you know, is supportive and welcoming to, to all. And we also have to make sure that we as administrators and um, um, we support our, our educators, uh, all our employees, because it's, people are going to be anxious. It's, um, again, returning to school after nine months. So there's a lot of work that goes into that, that we need to make sure that we're supporting our students, our families, and also our staff. I guess my follow-up question is, so we have 387 high need students. What's our number for pre-K to second? Because that sounds like a, a drastic increase. Pre-K to second, um, is June with us? June, what's the average number? I don't have the enrollment. Yeah, no, no, I am here. Um, well, kindergarten has about a thousand, first grade about, each one of those grade levels is about a thousand students. It's about a thousand. So we're going uh, the pre K. Sorry, um, Cynthia, the pre K classes, the Gen Ed over at the Arnone. Uh, there are two classes with twenty kids in the Gen Ed side. Now I'm not talking about the special education program. So there are about forty kids there, and then I can um, I can actually pull up the enrollment and see where we are at the Barrett Russell. Again, this would be hybrid. This might, we might have to do more than half and half um, students. And we would also um, phase in. I'm not saying that all three of those grades would start on the same day or even the same week. Um, you could phase those grades in over um, a couple of weeks to two weeks to three weeks period of time to make sure we're, again, bringing students into the building uh, slowly getting them used to the environment, working with them. Um, so again, that's about a thousand students per grade, but in a very methodical phased in approach. Um, Mrs. Sullivan, I think you had your hand up. Yes. Um, I just wanted to um, say, uh, I agree with the superintendent, the hybrid uh, would only bring is half the class goes two days, whatever, two days, and the other half goes the other two days. Um, so it would be like 500 kids. You're splitting them over. What, Superintendent Thomas, like 20 um, schools? That's 13. Like 20 schools. Well, that would be the, the younger kids. That would The younger students, that would be over 13 schools. 
over 13. Because at the elementary in the pre in the preschool at the Barrett Russell. Right. And so just an answer to that question, the enrollment, the current enrollment at the Barrett Russell Early Childhood Center, they currently have 34 regular ed students, 127 special education students. So <sighs> for a total of 161 students. Um, at the R known, the pre-K is 37 in the regular ed program, 29 special education, and uh, that's a total of 66 students. And we are just a little over, we're actually, our kindergarten numbers, our enrollment is at 1158. And first grade is 1043. Grade two is at 1071. And I just, just another question um, to, the, to Superintendent Thomas, please. Um, would parents have a choice whether they were gonna stay remote or they wanted to go hybrid? Absolutely. So we have parents, um, the survey was sent out again. Um, we've had about 1500 parents when we did this back in sep uh, August and September, asking them um, if we were going to a hybrid model uh, in person, would they uh, continue to keep their child at home? Uh, we have about 15,000 uh, 15, students signed up for that. Um, we would, again, before we, re we return in hybrid, we would call those families again. For, so their schools would call their families, ask, you know, explain the difference between coming back in a hybrid or uh, staying in a remote uh, um, virtual school. Um, so they know exactly what to expect because um, Right now, and rightfully so, because we've been remote from the start and obviously the first few months of the school year, um, those students have been kept in their school, um, you know, with their teachers. But when we come back in a hybrid model, if a parent chooses to keep their child home on remote, then they would switch away from their current teacher and uh, they would work with a remote teacher. Um, so they're, they're um, you know, that, that would change a bit for for parents choosing to keep their students in a virtual school. But we do have to, yeah, you're right, um, to answer your question, Troy, yeah, we do have to offer that option to families. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Um, anyone else? Okay. So, um, Superintendent, if I'm uh, mistaken. I, I'm, I'm under the impression we probably need a recommendation out of this subcommittee to the full committee with the uh, the timeline of, of returning to. Um, yeah, I would. I would. Yes, I would say, Mr. Yagas, you know that. Uh, you know, we also. I would say a target date of um, you know our students with disabilities um, um, for, um, the 19th of, of January, but however, I would put something in the motion that, you know, we're obviously going to hear Dr. Herman's, um, report coming up for us, but also I would put that this would be, um, we would review this obviously weekly as a committee, um, before obviously we got to that date, but it would allow us to plan, um, talk to first student plan transportation, um, have buildings get ready, um, and it would give us lead time, obviously, it would be just over a month now, with obviously with a vacation built in between, um, but it continue, obviously, to look at the metrics and the safety and health. So maybe a motion could be students with disabilities for January 19th, followed by February 1st, pre-K to two, followed by one grade level per week, all subject to continued review of the metrics and data, um, you know. Uh, and, oh, and that we would also offer a choice of remote learning for parents that chose that option. Does that sound like the, the way we want to do that? Um, does anybody want to make said motion? or said recommendation to the full committee. I'll make a motion to um, bring back special needs students with a target date of January 19th um, with pre-K to two following on February 1st and then one grade per week after 
also um, that we're looking at Dr. Herman's report to be reviewed weekly. Second. All right. We have a motion on the floor by Mrs. Sullivan, second by, I didn't catch who second. Is that yeah. Mr. Sullivan? Um, is there a uh, discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no discussion on the motion, I'll call the roll on the uh, proposed uh, recommendation to the full committee to uh, for our uh, re hybrid return to in-person learning. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. Okay, D'Agostino is a yes. Ms. Asak. Yes. Mrs. Mendez. Yes. Mr. Minichello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yeah. All right. The motion carries unanimous. Um, and again, for the for the public who may be concerned, remember that we are going to continue, as we said in the motion, to weekly review the metrics. Um, you know, the state is looking for a plan, and so this is our we are putting that plan together and putting it forward. But again, if the metrics warrant it, these dates will, will change. Um, so, um, all right. Um, other, is there anything else under the reopening plan? No, and, and the only thing I'll add, Mr. D'Augustin, is we continue um, to meet with our union presidents, the BEA, Kim Gibson, and other union presidents to continue to bargain the hybrid model and, um, you know, which, which we uh, have been working very well with our unions over um, for this, you know, ever since March 12th. So, um, we'll continue to do that so everybody is um, up to date and we continue to um, obviously bargain with them for a, um, you know, for a return to a hybrid model, what that will look like and obviously what's best for our students. So just wanted to make sure I added that in. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, then finally, there's other business. Is there any other business to come before the policy subcommittee? All right, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion, oh, to, motion adjourn. to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Properly seconded by Ms. Asak. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. All right, D'Agostino is a yes. Ms. Asak. Yes. Mrs. Mendez. Yes. Mr. Minicello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. All right. We are adjourned for about 30 seconds. Yeah, we're going to take a 30 second break and we'll get back into school committee at that time. Thank you.